I'm Dennis Anderson along with Julie Zenner. There's something for everyone tonight on Almanac North. Duluth will host an independent television festival in 2019 that will bring big names like HBO and Netflix to town and could have a big payoff for the region. Lieutenant Commander Roger Reiner talks about the perils of being deployed in Afghanistan on the latest video letter home. And we'll have some tips to stay safe on the ice from the DNR. These stories, the business news, and a lot more next on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thanks once again for watching. And Julie, we have a diverse show for viewers tonight. Lots of topics, lots of video tonight. I think up. you're exactly right. So we might as well get started. Our first guests are here. All right. Thank you, Denny, and welcome everyone. Some 1,500 people involved in the television industry will be coming to Duluth next year for an important event. The 14th Annual Independent TV Festival is a marketplace where writers can pitch their work to executives in the TV industry. Representatives from companies like Netflix and HBO will be in town for the five-day festival, and here with more is Ricky McManus from the Upper Minnesota Film Office. And Maria Anderson Hewitt is Media Communications Manager for Visit Duluth. And thanks to both of you for being here. Oh, Thank thanks you. for the invite. What exciting news. Ricky, maybe you can tell us a little bit about this festival and how Duluth got on the radar. Sure. Well, ITV Fest has been around for uh, about 14 years. It started in LA, and in LA it was just so she, she, hello, take my card. <laughs> and, uh, and so they wanted something a little more relationship building. So they took it to Vermont um, or in uh, Manchester, Connecticut. And it was really a wonderful, wonderful festival where it was relationship building. It's getting to know the creatives and the executives and having having coffee with them and getting to know their kids and so it became a whole different kind of festival. Sure. They wanted that same feeling. Well, Maria, what kind of an economic impact will this festival have on the region? Well it could be huge because we'll have not only 1500 people coming in um, but it, the thing that we're really excited about is it's a midweek festival. So they will be here on the weekend but they're bringing a boost to us in a time that can be kind of quieter um, in the midweek time, which is always a little quieter, um, filling those rooms, filling our restaurants, will, which will be huge. But then you don't just have that five, seven day festival. Then you have the potential of these creators, these producers bringing work back to Duluth and creating economic development here in Duluth. So the city's going to have to put on its best face yeah. trying to <laughs> entice movie producers to make television and big screen programs here. Absolutely, but when they see what we have here, I mean, the beauty that surrounds us that we kind of take granted for granted, I mean, I think that they're going to say, I could see shooting a series here. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to see. Now, Mayor Larson has compared the potential of this festival to Sundance. Is that a stretch? Not at all. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, um, they're already calling it that Duluth will be the Sundance of independent television, and I believe that to be true. Mm -hmm. Talk about the importance of independent television, because it seems like the, the whole landscape for TV is changing these days with so many different options and, and different ways for people to watch television. Absolutely. Right now, uh, with, a, with a, a camera that does not, not cost a lot of money, mm -hmm. you can actually go out and shoot a little pilot for about 20 grand. Mm -hmm. And that actually has the potential of being on one of those Netflix or HBO or Hulu. Um, so it's a whole different, it's a game changer. It's a, a very different way of thinking about all of this. That, you know, you could, you could be sitting there and a guy with a camera that just did a pilot could be sitting here and you've got an Emmy winner over here. And, you know, both of them are, are in competition 
So you really don't have to have the millions of dollars behind you to make a good mm -hmm. project. Maria, why Duluth? What does Duluth have to offer? Well, you know, speaking with the executive director of ITV Fest, Philip, he was really looking for that small city. You know, they were in Manchester, Vermont, which was a, which is a community of 4,000 people. So it's not a city, it's a small town. But they had that feel of, you know, they're all there for one reason and they'd be crossing the street and see different people from the festival. So it was really this cohesive feel of this festival. They weren't in some big city where you could get lost in the shuffle. So they wanted to keep that, but be able to grow. And so Duluth was kind of, you know, we're a small city that has a thriving arts community um, and is really willing to take on that exciting new festival. So um, I think that's why he was kind of interested. He came in Superior Street, he saw it, and he was like, this is it, <laughs> Superior Street. Was it Street. hard to convince the powers that be to do this festival here, or did it, was it not that difficult? It, it wasn't difficult at all because Philip, I think, is one of the major deciders, and he has a board that is um, with him also, and he was talking back and forth quite often with his board members, and he's saying, y you guys have to see this, you're gonna love it. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's moving here, so he, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, like he's, he, um, he was sold. <laughs> yep, he was sold. And he, he said he's gonna retire here. Yeah, <laughs> we'll now, take it. <laughs> do you have a sense uh, of who might be coming to town? Any, any names that people might recognize or faces that people would recognize? What? Well, you know, at this point in the festival, mm -hmm. um, the, they're, they're getting some of their entries in, and so you just, you never know. Mm -hmm. Who can attend this festival? The public can. Uh, and where will it be held? I mean, are you going to be in various locations or what? I think um, a majority of the festival will be in the Arts District at Zeitgeist in North Shore. And it will spread out a little bit, but I think that's where a good the good hub is going to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that was something else Philip really liked about Duluth is that we do have a thriving arts community. So. Yes the public will be very interested in coming and being a part of this festival. So maybe they can do more evening screenings where the public can come and see some of these potential works that could be on the small screen soon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maria, what about the potential exposure of Duluth? Well, I mean, it would be fantastic to see <laughs> us on, you know, a bunch of different TV shows or sitcoms. Um, so just the potential for Duluth and really the region just to have all of these creators, writers, producers, as executives coming into Minnesota, Duluth, the North Shore, exploring the region, seeing our beauty, seeing yeah. mm -hmm. all that we have here, the different buildings, sure. um, all the potential to shoot here, to write and have some inspiration yeah. here. Um, you know, we hope to see Duluth on the screen and then maybe people want to come visit us, right? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of success have independent producers have in the past because of these independent film festivals? Well, it, it helps get their projects off the ground and it gets eyes on the screen. So it certainly does help them. <coughs> and with this one in particular, you know, uh, the people of Netflix or HBO yeah. or Hulu, they are going, they're there to purchase their programming. So not only can the public see it, but it is a place for buying and selling. Mm -hmm. Of course, nothing's free. There were reports that uh, the organizers were looking for some financial support for mm -hmm. from whatever community they selected. What does Duluth have to put up to bring this to the community? Well, actually, not that much in the in the mm -hmm. realm of things when you see how much is going to be brought into the community financially plus. Um, so we're just looking for uh, around 200,000 mm -hmm. to begin with, and then some sustaining money for the next few years. And is that something that uh, the city is putting up itself? Are you, are you fundraising it's a combination, for it? and yes, we are <coughs> fundraising. Are independent mm -hmm. producers looking for ideas from the public as to what might be produced, or are they basically here to see the city, to see possible locations for shooting? Um, it is a little bit of both, and um, and I think, but most mostly, what it's all about is to have the buyers and the sellers meet and see the product that's out there. Mm -hmm. Now you you mentioned um, for the next couple of years, mm -hmm. so this isn't just a one-off. Oh this, no, this is something that potentially could be here for for a number of years. Is it many many years? Many many is years. What we're yep. thinking yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is no, fabulous. No end. At in sight. It's not a, a 
timeline of any kind. So. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but the, he really wishes to, wants it to go throughout the year. Mm -hmm. So there'll be workshops and one of, one of the favorite workshops that I'm, I, I'm so excited about is how to pitch your project. So learning how to do that more effectively, but that can be all over the region also. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of what he's looking at. Maybe bringing one up to the, um, maybe Ludlow's Island in the middle of sure. Lake Vermilion or right. something. Actually, a number of motion pictures have been filmed in Duluth and on the Iron Range. Then I think of uh, the Louis Anderson uh, sitcom mm -hmm. of a few years ago. Uh, it wasn't, f it was, sites were filmed in Duluth yes. and used on the sitcom. Yep. Um, so Hollywood is aware of Duluth. Oh, yes, oh, yeah. they are. I mean, Ricky, we need to give Ricky some credit here. Cause <laughs> oh. <laughs> not only for being a huge part in bringing ITV Fest here, but um, Ricky has, I mean, she's always busy doing site tours and showing off Duluth or all around the upper, upper part of the state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're sweet. <laughs> <laughs> now, now in, a, in addition to just the, the fabulous people and the fabulous scenes and, and all we have to offer up here with the art scene, what about uh, financial incentives for filmmakers? Is Minnesota still engaged in, in efforts to try to bring them in by offering like the snow baits that you used to? Yes, but it's, it's <coughs> the funding has dwindled to mm -hmm. just about nothing. And it's not enough to bring a, a big film in. Um, however, we're working on it and we're optimistic that this time up at the legislature, they'll see the value in it because mm -hmm. it will bring millions and millions into our economy. Mm -hmm. So why would anyone say no to that? Mm -hmm. And the Iron Range Resources has, has got their film incentive back up now too. Ricky, talk to us a little bit about the cultural scene in Duluth. Is, is Duluth, is this something new for Duluth or has it been a well-kept secret for a while? Boy, a little bit of both. A little, of, little of both. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of both. I, it's, um, well, the cultural scene I think here is, is part of why Philip just flipped when he, when he saw it, he felt it. We had a group of people in the crafts district and um, he loved the entrepreneur art and the creative side of things. And I think that really got him excited about what's here when he met all of those people. He said, the feeling here is just perfect. Huh. What do you think about some of the festivals we have, music and art festivals we already have, like um, Homegrown Music Festival, Duluth Dillon, Day, uh, Duluth Dillon Fest, um, and of course the Duluth Superior Film Festival. Right. You know, we have these festivals that have been created by people in the community already that um, I can only imagine they're going to be very excited to see mm -hmm. you know, ITV Fest. We are the only city that will have a film festival, the Duluth Superior Film Festival, and, and a TV festival. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. Well, Maria, as long as we have you here, the, the tall ships are coming back. Yes. This summer, only festival under a new name. Sail. Yes, Festival of Sail Duluth, uh, August 11th through the 13th. So that's a Sunday through a Tuesday. Um, still waiting to hear about, you know, what tall ships will be in the mix. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, but excited to have some dates yeah. so people can start booking and start fun. preparing. And, and how, how's Bentleyville doing this year? Good. Doing mm -hmm. great. I haven't heard about any numbers quite yet, but I mean, I've been there a few times <laughs> this year. <laughs> it's been a busy place, but, you know, I think um, we've, I think people have taken advantage of different ways to get to Bentleyville this year, so um, I think it's been a little less uh, congested there. Sometimes. All right, well, it sounds like there are exciting things happening year round. We're looking forward to the Independent TV Festival. Thank you for your work in bringing yeah. it here and to visit Duluth for supporting it. Julie wants to be in the movies. I do. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make it happen. Yeah. All right, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I'll call, I'll have my people call you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> thanks so much, appreciate Thank you. you. Both. Very, very much. Thank yes, you. Thank you. <laughs>up next now we continue our series of video letters home from lieutenant commander roger reinert who was deployed in kabul afghanistan reinert has been sharing his personal experiences to help us understand what life is like
with the thousands of our military deployed around the world. Now this week he talks about how safe he feels at his base in Kabul. Hi everyone, uh, Lieutenant Commander Roger Reinhardt sending you another video letter home from Afghanistan. Uh, so you can maybe tell that it started to get a little bit colder, uh, though nothing like at home. Uh, it's still pretty sunny, decently warm in the afternoons, but definitely cold in the evenings. Uh, one of the things I thought, forgot to mention in my last video letter was that uh, a big downside is Afghanistan, Kabul, has some of the worst air quality in the world. And during the winter, uh, it gets even uh, worse as uh, Afghans who don't have much um, literally burn just about anything they can to try to stay warm during those colder nights. So uh, I tried to get my runs in, uh, not in the morning <laughs> anymore. So I thought I'd take a little bit of time in this video letter home to talk about the safety situation here. Um, uh, I try to share headlines as I can, uh, as they're uh, open to the, to the public. Um, uh, the winter is typically a lower fighting season than the rest of the year. The Taliban, as it gets cold, uh, reintegrate back into villages where they can be kind of safe and warm, hunker down for the winter, and then in the spring gear back up again. This year's been different. There's really been no downtick in the winter. In, in fact, if anything, uh, we've seen more violence over the winter than during the summer. And that's largely driven by a couple of things. Uh, there's a presidential election coming up in April and uh, persistent peace talks are taking place. And so as the Taliban tries to have a strong foothold, uh, a strong presence at a negotiating table, um, they've continued their campaign, uh, their campaign of violence well into the winter. So. Um, have I seen, have I experienced? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, not long after I got here, um, the base came under a rocket attack. So I think there were about 39 different rockets uh, that were launched by the Taliban uh, at our base and at another base here in Kabul. About a month ago, uh, just a kilometer west of the base, uh, a fuel truck was used as a V-bed, vehicle-borne explosive de device. Um, and uh, that was a significant explosion um, with, with deaths uh, resulting. Um, we saw it, we heard it, we felt it. So that was definitely very sobering. Uh, and then in fact, just yesterday, uh, our base came under attack. So um, <laughs> also very sobering. And one of those uh, experiences where it wasn't until later um, when I was calling home and kind of uh, talking about it that I could feel my emotions kind of unpacking and, and decompressing from that. So, um, you know, I've said this uh, before, uh, but, you know, one of the things that I really appreciate about WDSE doing this and Almanac North airing these is just reminding people that this remains an, an active combat zone um, uh, and there is violence on a daily basis and we still have 15,000 troops here. So, especially in this holiday season, Please continue to keep us in your uh, thoughts and, and in your prayers so that uh, everyone who is here uh, serving our nation uh, makes it home safely back to their families. Thanks. With relatively mild temperatures so far this winter, Minnesota DNR officials are warning people to be safe on the ice. There have already been several deaths of ice fishermen this season who fell through the thin ice. The DNR says ice must be at least four inches thick to be safe on foot and eight to 12 inches thick for a car or pickup. Here's some tips on how to check for the ice, the ice for safety. I think the biggest mistake people make on is uh, getting too eager to get out there and catch a couple fish. They go out there when the ice is two, you know, one, two inches sometimes, and then that's when people get in trouble and fall through or they bring out vehicles too early. And uh, you know, that's not something you want to endanger your life for just to catch a couple sunfish or, or whatever. So it's very important to make sure that the, the lake is 
properly frozen and you got enough that, to keep you and your family safe. So the main thing you want to remember is try to be calm. It is scary. It is, uh, you know, the wind's kind of going to take it out of you as soon as you hit the water. Uh, but what you're going to want to do is try to remain calm the best you can. Hopefully you'll have your ice picks with you that I demonstrated. And you're going to want to try to pull yourself out using those ice picks. You don't want to try to get up and stand. You're going to want to try to pull yourself and cover the most surface area to prevent the ice from cracking. So you're almost going to think of it more as a crawl on your stomach as you're using the ice picks to kind of pull yourself forward. Just within this short vicinity, there's up to an inch difference in the ice, um, which can be a, a difference between falling through and not falling through. Let's turn now to the business news from the editors at Business North. Marsh and McClellan Agency has acquired Otis McGee Insurance, the largest privately owned independent agency in Northeast Minnesota. Otis McGee's 46 employees will continue to operate out of their existing locations in Duluth and the Iron Range. Tom Stender, who has served as chairman and CEO of Otis McGee since 2011, will continue to lead the company. Otis McGee also owns agencies in Hibbing, Virginia and Grand Rapids. Terms of the transaction were not disclosed. There has been a change of top leadership at Wisconsin Indian Head Technical College in Superior. Dr. Stephanie Erdman has been named Superior Campus Administrator and Vice President of Academic Affairs. She had been Dean of Academic Programs at WITC in Rice Lake. Prior to WITC, Erdman worked for the College of Menominee Nation in Kenesha. She succeeds Dr. Bonnie Copenhaver, who accepted a position as president of New River Community College in the state of West Virginia. Minnesota-based Carefree Living acquired the Buell, Hoyt Lakes, and McGregor Northland Village Senior Living Communities December 1st. Carefree is a division of Spectrum Health Companies and already owns senior care communities in several other northeastern Minnesota locations. One change went into effect immediately. Independent living apartments were made available in all of the newly acquired locations. Spectrum Health Companies also offer home care and rehabilitation. For more on these and other stories, visit businessnorth.com. If you have a comment on our show, call now, dial 218-788-2849 to leave a message or send an email to almanacnorth at wdse.org and visit the WDSE website for the latest program updates, broadcast schedules for all four of our channels and news and events here at the station. Now finally tonight we want to tell you about a PBS national special next week that will feature a rather unique northern Minnesota event. Lydia Celebrates America will include a segment on the Eel Pout Festival in Walker, Minnesota. The segment shot on Leech Lake last winter follows Lydia and her grandson at the festival and learning how to ice fish for eel pout. Here's a video clip from that show. This ice house sits on top of 30 inches of frozen water. I've been fishing fish since I was a little kid, but uh, about 12 years ago, I caught my first eel pout. It was about eight pounds, and I fell in love. Jason grew up near here. I grew up in a smaller community than Walker, even, and uh, about 450 people is the town I grew up in. Never really had a desire to move to a big city. I moved up north to northern Minnesota, and I live in a community just a hair north of Walker. Uh, I think we got 108 people in, in town. So I'll lift it up like two feet and then let it smash into the bottom. Lift it up. Okay, so it's like jig, yeah. Let it bang. So I'll go to lift it and there'll be a fish on. And then you just set the hook. After just, waiting. Keep coming up and then just kind of. And talking. It, shake it to try to, yeah. And more to waiting. That Miles gets one on the line. Is this something? There it is. Oh yeah, here we go. All get, right. get real. Okay. Oh. Just kind of let it fight. You don't have to. Uh, all right. Be in a race. It's not oh, a race. Oh, race. Oh, here he comes. Oh. Here he comes. All right. I got him. Wow. Oh my God. Look at that animal. Oh my God. <laughs> and what is the tradition about kissing? The, the, the eel that's, a, that's an eel pout fishing tradition. And is Jason really says line? it's good luck to kiss the eel pout. Are you, I think you both should kiss it. You caught it, but <laughs> you're, you're both here. Well, grandmas give kisses all the time. Right. I'm a grandma. And where do you kiss it? Well, I usually kiss them right 
Mwah, on the floor. Oh, I can do that. Yeah, easy peasy, yeah, right? right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mwah. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> we kissed it. So now we're indoctrinated. You're a part of the family. Oh, okay. part of the, cl the eel pout clan. Good. I'm impressed. I love it. Probably a five and a half, six pound fish. Come on, hold it. Come on. Mom want me to hold it? Why not? Don't you want to hold it? Put it down. You caught it. <laughs> Like me, you see? That's it. That thing is slimy. All right. Stand up with your fish. That's it. All right. Ah, that's nice. All right, I didn't need a picture. And keep in mind, you can see the entire show next Tuesday, December 18th at 8 p.m. on PBS North. Ooh, that eel pot looks good. <laughs> <laughs> Julie, do you ever get out for a little ice fishing? You know, I don't get out very often. My husband does, though. In fact, he came home with uh, a bunch of crappies today. Ah, and he didn't make me kiss them. Brought home the bacon. <laughs> <laughs> for Julie and the crew at Almanac North, I'm Dennis Anderson, wishing you a great weekend. Have a good night, everybody, and be kind.